What's up, everybody? Sixer here. Welcome back to the Skullgirls Podcast. And now we shall continue with part two of the special interview with Mike Z. Okay. Um, <laughs> faster. We're micro machine salesmen. Let's go. Okay, okay. Uh, so Main6 has been using your Z engine since mm-hmm. Skullgirls uh, Indiegogo two years ago. Mm-hmm. What kind of things does your engine let them do and games like Skullgirls do that they couldn't do otherwise? So why is your engine unique? compared to Musion, which you did kind of touch earlier, but specifically, what can Main6 do that other fighting games right now cannot do? Well, I mean, the short answer to that is they have full source. So if there's a bug in the engine or a variable is not uh, exposed to script or there is something that the current scripting system won't let them do, like access, I don't know, values on a projectile that was created by your opponent, which is like not something that the engine currently lets you look at, uh, they can go in the source and change whatever they want. Like, what, what the Skullgirls engine gives them over main six, aside from, like, running in HD and being able to run on consoles and, like, uh, having nice button mapping support and not having the bugs that uh, Mugen had, is it gives them the ability to fix anything that they need to fix. Right? If they want to... Like, if I ship the Skullgirls engine as it is with the implementation of the infinite prevention system as it is, that's all in code. So your choice is to use it or to not use it. You don't get to change it, right? Right. Since they have source access, they can change it. They can make it work totally differently, which they have. Like, that's the main thing that they get is they get a fully functioning fighting game engine that has been used to ship a game and has a poor or not... uh, art and asset creation pipeline um, that they can edit to their heart's content. That's right? like that's like one of the major things with Mujin is like there are problems with Mujin. You can do a lot of amazing things with Mujin. Um, oh, I'm going to forget. There's a character that I want to say has dragon in his name. Uh, I would totally look it up, but I'm talking. Um, that is like a person in gold armor and it does things like slow down time and change how meters work and allow you to to do really interesting mix-ups and like is incredibly well put together in Mujin. Like you can do a lot of really good stuff with what they give you, but since the engine was released as is and the company no longer exists and the source is not available, like if the engine doesn't let you do something, then you're just never going to be able to do it. Right? Right. I mean, that's the main reason, aside from being in HD and not having the, like, the projectile throw bug and things like that, that's the main benefit of the Z engine to main six. I mean, yes, it, it's nicely laid out and it lets you think about things in a, in a nicer way from a scripting perspective and it, it supports a lot of other things. But even if it didn't do that, if they had the source and they wanted to make it support one of those things, they could do that themselves. Okay, so it's it's really just the freedom to really make the game that they want. Yeah, like they don't have to. I mean, if we gave you like a closed source implementation, then you you would be making something that had strictures on it that you would just never be able to fix, right? the The main thing that it gives them is like, sure, it's a better starting point, but it's also the the ability to be able to change anything that they need to change to make their game the way they want it. That's a that's actually really big. Guess I don't really understand it. Okay, we're gonna. That's move. why, like, when you go to when you buy an Unreal license, if you just want the engine, it's like a hundred bucks or whatever. If you want full source, it's like seven hundred fifty thousand. Like, right. Yeah. That makes sense. Otherwise, you you don't really have freedom. Okay. Um. So we're gonna move back over to the community and from Skullgirls. Uh. Yeah. So you mentioned. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that. Uh, Skullgirls in general wasn't exactly what you expected uh, but the community enjoys it and so you're happy with that. Uh, what aspects of the community and the way that people play the game right now would you say that you're most surprised by? Uh, let me clarify that question by saying that like Skullgirls is probably like 97% what I expected it to be. Okay. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I implemented very early on that I was like, when people get really good, this will make a big difference. And then for, like, three years, nobody did anything. And now people are finally using it, and it makes me feel really nice. Um, it's, it's, 
way more than 90% how I thought the game was going to turn out. Uh, there are just like a few little things here and there that I think would improve it that I won't be able to do because the community likes it the way that it is. Okay, that's that's fair. I'm sorry for paraphrasing. It's okay. Um, so you asked what things the community does surprise me? Yeah, that you wouldn't, that you didn't expect when you first made the game. Like, what what aspects has the community brought out in Skullgirls that you didn't really see moving the direction that it moved? Um, I, let's see. So I thought that Eliza was going to be good for different reasons than she ended up good. Um, I thought that Fukua's weaknesses were a lot more apparent than most people seem to find them. And it's taken everybody like a long time to be able to be like, yeah, you know, she's not actually that dumb. Um... So it's more like, play style differences you're seeing in characters than anything? I mean, like, I don't know how far you wanted me to answer that question. Okay, I that's mean, fair. Um, you could talk about meta. You could talk about uh, the general characters that are, that are used that you didn't really see being quote-unquote top tier or more popular than other characters. Um, the way that people go for, for different things. For example, um, in the SIG interview... He stated a lot of people go for, for burst baits, and uh, it, it's moved now towards more reset combos than burst bait combos, necessarily. Um, yeah, I, so I thought... Hmm. So I always wanted resets to be super important, and it took a long time for people to like start to do them, mm -hmm. period. And I... Like, there are a bunch of things that I did with the game that make resets good, like specifically, you know, not having air techs and things like that, that like uh, elevate resets as the playstyle of choice. Um, well, after the addition of um, IPS, uh, which was there from the beginning, I'm sure you mean Undizzy. I, that's exactly what I mean. I'm really sorry. After the after the addition of Undizzy, um, <laughs> after the addition of Dizzy. Uh, the meta did start moving more towards resets, like more and more resets were incorporated into gameplay. Well, I mean, so that's something that I had to... Okay, so two things. The first one is Undizzy enforces neutral. Like, it is designed specifically to enforce neutral because once Undizzy is full, even if you land a hit, what you can do off of that is super limited. So uh, you, you do resets, which are things that the other person can get out of. They're not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Right, you might land them a lot, but the other person had a chance to do something, and they didn't uh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if if I give you a chance to escape and you don't, doesn't mean you didn't have the chance. That's the difference. Um, Undizzy also like shortens combos to the point where you will generally be touching somebody three times or four times, even if you do optimal stuff before they're done uh, at the same ratio. Because like obviously, doing more damage lets you touch them fewer times before they die. Uh, but like when the so this was a giant mistake that I made with vanilla SG that I wish I hadn't made, but I did and it took a while to fix. Um, so I was concerned because no game had ever had anything like the Skullgirls infinite prevention system. Like no game had ever actually cared what moves you used and what combo you were doing. They just kind of cared about general conditions like has it been 10 seconds or has have you done 40% damage or whatever. Hmm. Um, or have you done enough fierces and roundhouses to fill up their uh, undizzy meter in Marvel 2? Like, you... Skullgirls was the first game that actually cared what you did, specifically what you did, and I was concerned that the infinite prevention system was too strict before the game came out. So I did a bunch of things. So, like, the current... IPS is actually still nicer than the original one that I had, which is just all light punches count the same, all medium punches count the same, all hard punches count the same, air ground, crouching, everything. Wow. Right? Um, I was concerned because, like, not a lot of people had spent time trying to make combos in it or whatever. I was concerned that that was way too strict. So, like, a couple of weeks before we put the game out, I loosened everything up 
Uh, I made air and ground normals count separately, and I also made standing and crouching normals count separately, and command normals count separately, and all specials, like, different strengths of the same special counted differently from each other. Like, I differentiated all of that very shortly before the game came out, and that was a giant mistake. Um, that led to vanilla, which was, I touch you, I do something that's 150 hits, and then you die. Hmm. And then... As soon as the next character comes in, since nothing carried over from the previous combo, I touch you and I do it again. Um, yeah, that was a huge mistake. Vanilla Skullgirls was pretty bad as a result. Um, and I shouldn't have done it, but I was like, I didn't want it to come out and people to be like, man, I can only do like five hits and I don't understand how any of this works. Right. Like, I'm done with this. But instead, it turned out to be, okay, so somebody touches me and then I can literally go make a sandwich and come back. That's also not fun. But, like, I hadn't experimented with it enough, and that was a pretty huge mistake. So, like, the IPS strictness and the uh, addition of Undizzy and, like, the, the game itself has undergone massive changes since it came out. And, like, those were some of the few things that I was willing to do where it's like, I do not give a crap if you as players like this because that is a bad game. So yeah. I am going to fix it so it is less bad. That's fair. Right? Like... Polly or Heavy Jugs, wherever he is now, um, loved being able to touch you and then you die. Sev also loved being able to touch you and then you die. But, like, that's not fun and that's not a good game. Um, there are other games still in existence where you touch them and then they die and it is still not fun. So while it was in my power to fix that, I fixed that because if I didn't fix that, then the game would actually be dead at this point. You're right. Um, John, why did you ask this one? This is a dumb one. Okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> there is a You're physical. Not I'm not. No, I'm not. I don't think I edited it out last time in Render's interview yes. either. Zid is dumb. <laughs> Continuing. There is a physical release of Skullgirls coming to Japan. How did that happen in Japan before it came in the U.S.? John is upset because he only plays physical releases of games. For example, this last weekend, we spent almost twice as much no it was actually the same amount of money but we spent extra money on transportation and gas to go all the way down to gamestop to go get uh a 3ds version of fucking sapphire when it was the same price in the dlc store but he didn't want to get it because he needed the physical copy of it you know what i completely understand what really yep uh i mean <sighs> he dlc anything you don't actually own right but if it gets lost you can just easily download it again. Yeah, and if they take it off of the store or the store goes down in 10 years, you just can't get it again, period. Uh, I mean, I still have six copies of Chrono Trigger with all the different endings saved on them. You know, that's not possible to really do on DLC unless you want to, like, make a bunch of different accounts. And it's just... I completely understand wanting a physical copy of things because also it comes with, like booklet art and a case and like it looks cool and it's actually a thing that you have and like if I want to bring it over to your house I don't have to bring my whole system with me I get it I completely get it um, the reason that it happened in Japan before it happened in the US is very 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 simple which is making a physical copy of a thing costs a ton more than making a digital copy of a thing so there needed to be a company that was willing to shoulder the burden of making a physical copy of a thing and thought that they would be able to make enough money back to like finance that and no company in the US was willing to do so. Okay. Um but Arc Japan thought it was, was worth it. Yeah. That's so fair. we're doing it with Arc. Like Arc. that has I mean, Autumn doesn't have the money to manufacture discs. We certainly don't have the money to manufacture discs for Skullgirls. Like it needed to come from another company that thought it was a worthwhile investment. Okay. And also, a lot of U.S. companies don't look at fighting game numbers as successful, right? I mean, so Smash sold whatever it was, 4 million copies, and Vanilla Street Fighter 4 sold like 3.75 million copies or whatever. Smash um, Melee is still being sold at $60 in some locations. I, oh, I went out yeah, to go buy Melee, a copy. Melee's never going to reach as many copies as Brawl or uh, Wii U just because there aren't as many people that want it. Huh. And you can't buy it digitally. Um, right. Like, they can never sell... If they printed 600,000 copies of Melee, that's as many as they can sell. 
Hmm. Right. So, so that's why the price was never going to go down. Yeah. I mean, you can't buy it digitally. Like, you have to have a disc. And even if you can buy it digitally, then you're playing it on a software emulation of a thing, like on the Wii. Um, anyway, like, fighting games don't sell, you know, 10, 12, 14, 60 million copies of a game uh, because the audience is smaller. I mean, Street Fighter 4 was hugely successful for a fighting game. Uh, Skullgirls at this point uh, has totally sold over a million copies. Uh, if you look on Steam Spy, it sold over 600,000 copies just on Steam. Mm-hmm. Um, that's fairly successful. I mean, like, that's actually really successful for a fighting game. But, like, a lot of companies, you know, if you do a sales projection of, like, yeah, if you print physical copies, you could sell, you know, 50,000 of them. Like, they're not going to, that's not a. That's not enough. a big enough price point for, yeah. for physical release. Okay. That makes sense. That's fine. It was still a dumb question, John. Yeah, okay. I disagree. <sighs> He just has a thing about being able to touch stuff. He was like, uh, can we please... I am just- not going to touch that question. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I'm not touching that question at all. <laughs> it was more of a statement, but okay. Yeah, um, I mean, really, the answer is like, it happened because Ark has experience making fighting games, and they understand what goes into one and what sort of sales expectations you can have from one mm-hmm. and they were able to say we think that this is a worthwhile thing to do okay and that's that's the entire reason that makes sense uh, since we only have a little bit longer i'm going to ask you two more questions and it, they are going to be uh, essentially what you've already talked about earlier i, I want to get a little bit more in depth with it before i ask that question uh you basically said that there are some things that need to be done to make a game a good game. Let me ask you this question. What do you think separates a good game and a bad game? And the reason I asked this question is because I've seen a stream you did earlier when you were uh, doing streams to start Indivisible. You're, I believe you guys were streaming Metroid. Uh, you went really, really in depth into what the developers were thinking when they were thinking that game and, and the foresight they were thinking to essentially what would really reward the player, what would, what would cause the player, you know, uh, what would reward the player and what would uh damn it what's the word i'm frustrate thinking? thank you frustrate the player yeah that word came easily to mind yeah it was <laughs> it was frustrating um but could you also attribute that to what makes a good game and a bad game or do you believe that there are other qualities that make a good game and a bad game as well well i mean ultimately the only thing that makes a good game is whether people have fun with it like they're Video games are for fun. They're, you can't ever forget that. And if somebody enjoys a game, then it is good for them, right? There are things that you can look at that make games objectively better or worse. I mean, for me, it's much easier in fighting games or in competitive environments, right? Like first-person shooters or LOL or whatever those are, MOBAs, that yeah. kind of thing. Like. Um, even versus puzzle games, like it's the reason why I think Tetris Attack is pretty much the only good versus puzzle game. Um, in a game where two people are competing, one of the things that will make it a good game in the long run, as opposed to I have fun with this, you know, because it has a character that I like in it or whatever, is that both people get to participate in playing even when both people are good. Um, when you watch, like, I, I have to use Marvel 3 as an example because it's a really good example, right? When you watch Zero touch them once, kill the character, get an incoming, kill the character, get another incoming, and then kill the next character, the other person wasn't having any fun. No. And it's also debatable whether the person playing Zero was having as much fun as they would have if they were actually playing the game as a versus game with another person. I mean, sure, it's enjoyable to, like, I landed this thing, and if I don't screw up my execution, I'm going to win this game, and that's pretty great. Yeah. But would overall, like, in a non-specifically tournament setting, would the person playing Zero enjoy it more if they had to think more or if they had to do mix-ups more or if they actually had to, like, participate in the interaction with the other person more often? Um, 
I think yes. And I mean, this is one of the reasons why I was willing to screw with the infinite prevention system and add on Dizzy and do other things is because what I think makes a fighting game good, I mean, sure, there are other aspects like, you know, are the controls responsive and it doesn't give you moves that are at weird points and like do the special move motion assignments make sense? Does it not require you to hit three buttons at the same time like all the other stuff? But like one of the most fundamental things that I think makes a fighting game good is how often there is what is referred to as neutral, right? How often are you in a situation where both people are getting to make decisions? So I was willing to do a lot of heavy-handed stuff to ensure that in Skullgirls, in every match, there will be at least, if everybody plays to like the top of their abilities and nobody screws anything up and everybody starts every combo with like three bars, like there will be at least six to eight times during that match where both players are making decisions about something. Um, obviously, this doesn't necessarily extend to other genres like Super Metroid. There are other reasons why it is good, and some other Metroidvanias are not as good. Right. But and it's genre specific. But like, I think in every genre you can distill it down to a basic statement of what makes a game in that genre good or not. Uh, people will still have fun with games that are less good in other ways. And a lot of times, if you have good presentation and music, people are willing to forgive a lot of the other decisions that you make worse. Um, but like, in, a, in fighting games and in any kind of competitive thing, I think it's pretty easily defined. And I think, to me, that is the definition. right? How much of the game is actually a game where both people are playing against each other as opposed to one person is doing an option select and the other person can make a better or worse choice, but they're still going to lose some health. Um, Genijin is a good example from Third Strike. Like, when Yun activates Genijin, right, you are no longer trying to win. You are just trying to not lose 60% health. If he activates Genijin and you lose 10% health because you get hit by a command throw into a rush punch at the very end, that is your, the scenario that you are hoping for. Um, you can be praying for lucky situations where he doesn't do any damage or where you get to parry something and you turn the tables and waste all the rest of his Guinea Jin time. But in general, as soon as he activates that super, it, it is no longer a neutral situation. It's no longer a situation where both players are hoping for gain. You are just hoping for as little loss as possible. And minimizing that type of thing is, I think, what makes fighting games better or worse. Okay. So uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's really two players playing against each other, having a chance to really actually play against each other. Yeah. And I mean, this is one of the reasons why people complain about Skullgirls or Marvel 2 or even Guilty Gear is like, I get hit and I don't want to watch a combo. I want to be back to a spot where I'm doing something. And... Uh, like people that don't really sit down and analyze it think I got hit by something that was like 40 hits and took you know 8 seconds that's infinitely more frustrating than getting hit by something that's 3 hits and it's over right away mm -hmm. but if that 8 second thing took off a third of your health and the 3 hit thing took off 60% of your health it's actually less of an interaction or less of a what my previous definition of a good game to get hit by the three hit thing mm -hmm. because you will only get to play neutral one more time before you lose mm -hmm. as opposed to two more times. Um, right? Like if you look at ST, yeah. if they land a jump in and all the random rolls are correct, like Ken can do, there's a, I have a video somewhere of Ken getting really lucky with all of his damage and dizzy rolls where he does jump short, crouch short, jab DP and it does 75% damage and dizzies the other person. And like, were you to design a game where that was the case all the time, even though that's a three-hit combo, that would be way worse than almost anything that happens in Marvel 2 or Marvel 3, because in Marvel 3, the most damage that they can do is a third of your total health. That makes sense. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Street Fighter 2 does that all the time, and that was the perfect example. I was thinking more of... Um, I've been watching... I guess he's not M. Bison, the, the, huh? What's it, Boxer? The Boxer character? What's his name? Balrog? 
Oh, I guess yeah, it is Balrog, huh? But in 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 Street Fighter Two, he's known as M Bison because all the names are switched around. So and whenever in the Japanese I... ones, and he's still known as M Bison in the Japanese ones now. Oh, he is. They switched all the names around because they didn't want to get sued. Yeah. Yeah, dude. M Bison is the pun, right? He's yeah. Mike Tyson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um. So they switched all the names around to not get sued. That's why Bison and Vega and Balrog are named different things in non-Japanese versions. Yeah, he explained it to me. I just That's actually why you have to refer to them as Boxer and Dictator and Claw, because the names aren't consistent. Oh, wow. Okay, sorry, Boxer. Yeah. No. John was, it, it was bothering me. He explained all of it to me, but I just, I, to be perfectly honest, I really don't care very much about Street Fighter. It's very, it's very boring to me. Okay. I try. Um, but... But no, you're right, because there are a lot of things in that game. It's essentially a, a much shorter game where you have a lot less control over it, and it really is almost essentially one player not not really dominating the game, but it just feels like you have less of a chance to really play because yeah. of the and amount I mean, of damage you have. That's also why I sincerely applauded Marvel 2's decision to remove stun. I mean, they didn't remove it. They actually turned it into when you would be dizzy, it lets you out of the combo, right? That's why it's called Undizzy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why Skullgirls doesn't have stun and has Undizzy. Like, I applaud that decision more than pretty much any other single decision in fighting games because the addition of stun makes, gives you yet another place where you didn't get to make a decision, right? And in abused cases, like in Makoto's 100% stun in Third Strike, she touches you once and you're now dead. And if stun didn't exist, that wouldn't happen. Mm. Um, people point to stun as a positive thing because it makes players have to play more cautiously because otherwise they're going to eat a bigger punish or whatever. But as long as you can stun someone off of one touch or off of two touches, it removes another decision that they get to make before they lose. And I think that's like a design sin, basically. Makes sense. Like, it means, what well, if you're, you know, one jab away from being stunned, all of the opponent's attacks are just as useful. They can go for a jab, they can go for a throw, they can go for an uppercut, whatever, because as long as it touches you, they get a full conversion off of that attack, even if they normally wouldn't. Um, like, ST... Uh, I mean, I still think that if ST came out today, nobody would play it. Like as soon as people found there are a lot of there are a lot of things that I find up in Street Fighter, and this is people are gonna hate me for saying this. You have this, to be but, clear which version of Street Fighter. Okay, I'm sorry. About, they're vastly different. I know that. I know that. I feel like uh, Street Fighter Two, Street Fighter Four, and I would even go so far as to say Street Fighter Three. I feel like if each one of those games came out on their own in the next year or something. I don't think the community would be as positive as they have been in the past with those games. Even Street Fighter 3. Even Street even even Third Strike. And as their own. as as I their mean, own. I'm sorry, the as their own games. Like if someone rebranded that game entirely and came out with it under the whole shinier thing, it was on its own console whatever, it was brought up to date and all this extra shit and they had the same mechanics that they did inside of Street Fighter 2, inside of Street Fighter 3, inside of Ultra people would hate those games and no one oh, would I don't think SF4 would do would have done nearly as well if it didn't have the branding. I think 90% of its success was the branding. Mm. I mean, people played it because it was new, money was put behind it because people were playing it because it was new. Lots of casual play. I mean, the reason Street Fighter 4 sold so well has nothing to do with the game at all. They could have put out Ono's original version from Fight Club which was terrible before Seth did anything to it. Um and it would have done just as well in terms of sales. People bought it because it was 10 years and they could finally play Ryu and Zangief again. That's, um, that's irrelevant to the fighting game community. I mean, sales and the fighting game community are not related to each other, right? That's why Sakurai doesn't give a crap about making a competitive smash, like, because that's yeah. not what sells. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. That's not, uh, that's not that's why. It's because... Uh, he actually despises games. The reason why he... I know he, he said a lot of things in interviews, but what I mean is, if making a competitive game would mean that it would sell twice as many copies, mm -hmm. then he would not have that view. Really? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? Like, if... His whole thing if, is he wants it to be fun. Yeah, I know, but Nintendo wants it to sell. Hmm. And... 
Smash sold because you can fight Samus against Link. Right? The fact that it turned out to be decent at a at melee was incidental yeah. to whether it sold or not. Um, Street Fighter 4 sold because of branding. The FGC likes to think that it sold because it's Street Fighter 4 and it has all the Street Fighter 4 things, but that's irrelevant. I mean, Vanilla was not a very good game. Ultra is actually okay. I mean, it's still not the game for me because I don't really like classic Street Fighter gameplay, but like vanilla was you know not a great game mm. um the i agree with i think if they put out st today and no one knew anything about it and people were discovering the things that have been discovered at the speed at which they've been discovered in other games i don't think a lot of people would play it um i don't necessarily think that about third strike because third strike feels completely different from other street fighters which is one of the reasons why i like it but also i'm biased as hell um, I think it still feels different, but um, I guess I guess my main issue is that it just seems really especially slow. Almost like there's too much neutral in the game. Do you disagree? Uh, yeah. I mean, one of the so one of the things that I like about Third Strike is that randomness like really random randomness is actually rewarded and really random randomness is hard for people to do like there's you know that thing where you're in a fighting game and like you're playing against somebody else and a stare down happens like you're both sitting there crouch blocking and neither of you is trying is quite sure what the opponent is going to do and then one of you does something Mm -hmm. that length of time where both of you are waiting before one of you does something is actually pretty standard across most people And one of the things that playing Third Strike will teach you is about how long that time is and to make a decision, any decision, doesn't matter which decision, before that time happens. Hmm. Or to wait just slightly longer than that time so that the other person commits to something. That's usually not rewarded by other games. And it is super rewarded by Third Strike, which is one of the reasons why I like Third Strike. I mean... I like 3S because it doesn't feel like a classic Street Fighter, right? Zoning is terrible because of parries. Um, The wake-up game is very real. There aren't a huge number of option selects that you can apply in a bunch of different situations. There are some parried or not parried option selects that you can apply, but for the most part, it's actually like you versus the other person the vast majority of the time. Uh, There are still things that are not great about it. I mean, Chun has a bunch of really good buttons and is too short and does too much damage, but... On the whole, like the the underlying systems are excellently put together. Uh, I don't feel like that about a lot of the other Street Fighters, but um, uh, like I said, I'm biased because the way that that game worked out is something that I really like. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that a lot of old games still have followings because those people were able to evolve their opinion of the game over 10 years and they were heavily invested in it by the time stupid things were found. Yeah. Like, there are some really dumb things in ST. Um, even Vega's 50-50 wall dive thing is, is really stupid by modern standards. Um, T-Hawk's OS command grab <laughs> corner That's trap the is, silliest thing I've ever seen in my life. Really bad. <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, he's a really bad character without it. Like, the, at the end of the day, though, if you play ST and you enjoy the way ST works, most characters are viable. Yeah. Right? That's, like, the other part of what makes a fighting game a good game. Uh, and for this, I'm going to use Marvel 2. Okay? So I said one of the things that makes a fighting game a good game is how much people get to play against each other. Right. Um, another thing that makes a fighting game a good game is how much of the roster is usable when people are actually good at it. Right? Like, you won't see normal people playing Sean or 12 in Third Strike. No, uh, you, won't. you won't see normal people playing... I don't even know who's bad in SF4. Dudley. Dudley? No, I'm so? sorry. I'm sorry. Dan. Dan, Dan, Dan. Oh, okay. Dan, sure. You won't see normal people playing Dan. Um... You won't see a lot of people playing characters that are lower mid-tier. I mean, you won't see a lot of people playing, like, 
uh, Robokai or whatever in some versions of Guilty Gear. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't see a lot of people playing Pot and doing very well in Exerd, like because that game has super tier imbalance. Yeah. But like, you. Let me ask. You, let me ask this. No, question. Let me this finish. Is gonna, let me oh, finish. Oh, sorry. 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 <laughs> you can. You can use that as a measure of a game's success, but I don't necessarily or as a measure of how good a game is, but you also have to look at how the gameplay works between the characters that people do pick, was where I was going with that. I'm sorry it took so long to get there. But like, okay, so in Guilty Gear X and Core, you can pick most characters, and I think like even all of the characters that were considered super terrible won a, an SBO back when there was still SBO. Um, you can actually pick a surprising amount of the cast in Marvel 3. Um, you can pick a very small amount of the cast in general in Third Strike, and you can pick an extremely small amount of the cast in Marvel 2. Okay? But, if you look at the gameplay between Chun and Chun, or Chun and Yun, or Chun and Ken in Third Strike, that gameplay is broken. Right? It is, it is very flat. It is fairly skewed toward certain things being super good and certain things being completely unuseful. And it's not representative of the gameplay from the entire rest of the game. Uh, if you look at Marvel 2, the gameplay between, for example, uh, MSP and like Storm sent Capcom or uh, Cable sent Capcom is as involved and as active and as neutral heavy and as uh, cerebral as any top tier gameplay in any other game that ever existed. And I think like that's one of the reasons why the people that like Marvel 2 really like it is because at a lot of games, or in a lot of games, at high level, the game kind of breaks down, right? Whether or not you see character representation, there are some things where it's just like, you will never see this move used. You will only see this character played this way, that kind of thing. Um, Marvel 2 isn't like that. When you get to a really high level, even though you are stuck playing a very small amount of the cast, mm -hmm. the gameplay that you get out of those characters is some of the most interesting and most fun gameplay in any fighting game that's ever been made. Hmm. So, like... Because there is neutral involved and there are lots of decisions that are made and there are tons of things where like this situation happened, do you know how to properly react to it? Like and every I mean, even when you have two sentinels flying around, that's neutral. That's not somebody being comboed to death, right? Like to me that's the difference between Marvel Two and Marvel Three is when you get really good at Marvel Three, it's you touch them and they lose. When you get really good at Marvel Two, it's still neutral heavy and everything. Yes, you are limited to a very small portion of the cast. I'm particularly sad that, like, you can't play Hayato or Chun-Li or whatever and, like, get anywhere. But when if you looked at that game as what the game turns into at a high level, it's one of the games that holds up the most. Um, CVS 2 also holds up fairly well at a high level, but you're, again, super limited in terms of roster choice. And um, when you actually do get to that, like, the difference between mid and high level in CVS 2 is, like, light years of unrelated things. Um, I'm sorry, that was a giant digression, but anyway. No, no, to no. To get back it, to your like, original question, it covered. I think there are certain things that you can figure out about any genre that will make a game good or not. Mm -hmm. However, I think that in a lot of cases, um, since design is not as easy for people to critique as art or music um, or sound or characters or whatever, um, People in general are a lot more willing to forgive poor design than they are to forgive poor other things. Like, if a game comes out and it's beautiful and whatever, and it's, like, moderately boring, people will still play it and they'll still love it because it's beautiful and sounds nice and gets them into it. Now hold the phone. The podcast isn't over just yet. Stay tuned for the next part with our special interview with Mike Z.